Martin, nice to see you from Prague. I have to start with our main TV pundit. Karel Poborski is in our studio almost every weekend. So how do you remember him from the season 1996-97, where you won Premier League, obviously, together for Man United? Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, he, he, just take the football away. I think you remember him for his hair. <laughs> <laughs> no, what a, what a great player. Uh, he came off the... Uh, as. He came off the Euros in '96 as an absolute superstar, and uh, it was one of them. Uh, you know, you come through the summer and you you don't know who the manager's going to sign. He signed him. Uh, it was really, really good, uh, and you know, he, he was such a nice guy and what a great player he was. And uh, I, I think he was not. He was he ill at some time. I hope he's well and doing well and enjoying life. He is, don't worry, he, he's doing well. He was ill, that's that's correct, but now he's totally fine, enjoying football and uh, non-football life as well. When I look at your squad you had in 1997, Peter, there were so many big, big characters. You, obviously, Eric Cantona, Andy Cole, Ryan Giggs, uh, Roy Keane, or at that time, talented players like Beckham, Neville, Scholes. How did you, back then, set the roles in the dressing room? I mean, who had the main word and who, on the other hand, had to be quiet and listen to leaders? No, it wasn't like that. Absolutely not. So we, uh, we had a manager who recruited not just for footballing skills, but also for personalities and characters. Because he, he be, truly believed that in order to, to achieve what he wanted to achieve, fulfill his ambitions. He needed big, strong personalities to go on the pitch in, in you know, every, I can't remember, we calculated one that was like every 4.2 days or something like that, which averaged over my career um, and, and, and do the job. And, and the, you know, playing the Premier League uh, is tough. Play for Manchester United in the Premier League is very, very tough. And of course, Move that into Europe. That year you were talking about, we went to the semi-finals and we lost against Dortmund. And um, you know, it's a lot of games. And and f as from a manager's point of view, if you want to to be at the top of football for that football club, well, you need you need strong uh, footballers, strong players who can take responsibility. And he was looking at that in recruitment. And and you know. Our dressing was fine. That was there was no no big leaders. No one was dictating uh, who was talking or uh, it was a, a dressing room full of winners who who basically were there to win football games. And everybody had that common understanding that uh, this is why we're here. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you look through if you look through all of Sir Alex's teams all the way until 2013, they were all guys like that, all strong personalities, people who on the pitch could deal with adversity straight away and stay strong. Well, maybe back to Czech players, great goalkeepers from our country played in the best league in the world. I mean, Premier League, I could start with Ludek Mikloško from West Ham United, Pavel Srnicek for Newcastle or Petr Cech, of course. Um, do you remember Ludek or Pavel, by the way? And generally, how was the relationship between goalkeepers in England in times when you played for Man United, Peter? Yeah, I mean, I don't like Lu uh, uh, Mikloško because he played far too well in our last game in 95, was it? Um, again, we needed to win and he played so well and uh, it was our last game. If we'd won that game, we would have won the league and he stopped us. Well, he's a nice guy, don't get me wrong. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you don't have much time to uh, to uh, socialize or, but there's always been that mutual respect. We We kind of have a different role in our teams than uh, the other 10 outfield players. And in that, we kind of respect each other, probably more from our positions and, and understand, you know, that uh, we have to stick together a little bit. So there's always been this mutual respect between goalkeepers. And um, you're, you're completely right. I mean, some some fantastic goalkeepers you've had there. You're obviously, uh, Ludwig and Pavel were in my area and then and Peter Cech was a little bit later. And Peter Cech is uh, 
this number two goalkeeper to get into the Hall of Fame. So he made a really, really big stamp on, on uh, an impression on, on the Premier League for both Arsenal and, uh, and of course, Chelsea. When we mentioned Peter Cech, uh, when I was thinking about uh, his and yours story, there's maybe one similarity. You also, for the last years of your career, moved to rival of your main club, Peter. Um, Peter signed for Arsenal directly from Chelsea. So how important was it uh, that time not to read maybe the fans pages? Because obviously you had to expect some criticism from the fans, am I right? So are you saying I went to a rival? Yeah. Did I? Who did I go to that was a rival? Oh, I mean, you, you, you went, you know, because for the last... Where, where did I go? You went to Man City, right? Yeah, but they were not a rival. Okay, that time, yeah, but... <laughs> I would never, if, if they had been a rival, I would never have gone. Okay. Never, ever. I wouldn't, I mean, I, I really enjoyed being at Aston Villa. It just didn't work out. And it was very, very important to me that it wasn't a rival to Manchester United. And of course, in Man City, it was the same. It was a newly promoted team. Different ownership uh, in between then and what it is now. There's been another owner as well. So it's a completely different club that I played for. So they were not a rival. Uh, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, Petr Cech went because he had to go. You know, he didn't, it, it wasn't like, you know, he had no other options. So, so... I mean, in this, the criticism is always, you know, the lack of loyalty, you know. But there isn't any loyalty in football. What if a football club says, we don't need you anymore? Are you then supposed to not go to what you call a rival to continue your career? I don't understand that, well, how that can happen. Um, and it, it's just the way it is. I mean, he was so good, so he had the opportunity to go to another big club. And in all fairness, if you look at if you look at what's happened between those three big London clubs, Arsenal, Tottenham, and and Chelsea, it's really only between Arsenal and Tottenham there hasn't been much traffic. Other than that, there's been a lot of traffic between the three clubs. So, I, I the only one I can remember is Saul Campbell. Really, can't remember anybody else. Well, we can say that Peter Cech was next generation of goalkeepers in your context, obviously. You finished in summer 2003 in England, Peter came to Chelsea in 2004. So how do you rate his career in which he won Premier League uh, four times and still has most clean sheets, uh, yeah. 202 in the league? No, he was fantastic and, and uh, of course a lot of things changed for, for Chelsea from that period on. Mourinho came in and made the club uh, a winning football club in the Premier League era um, and you don't win anything if you don't have a high high quality goalkeeper that's your that's your starting point then you build your spine um, and of course you you know you got players like uh, uh, John John Terry you know in that spine Makalele in that spine Drogba up front so you have you know you have quality um, all the way up there and what Petr, Petr Cech did was, I mean, he, I mean, he's just been so, so stable. So, so, I mean, trying, I'm trying to, you know, see if I can remember mistakes. If I, they're not, they're nothing pops in, you know. So, and that's important. If you, if you want to win football games, you, you don't want your goalkeeper to make mistakes. You want your goalkeeper to be playing at a, uh, at a very stable but very high level. And when he when when it's a bad game, that that sort of low level still got to be very high. And he was all that. And of course, you know, sometimes you peak uh, and you play unbelievable games. And of course, he had them as well. But Petacek was he was he was a very 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 big part of of uh, this Chelsea winning team. And I would go as far and say, you take him out, they probably win don't win as much. Uh, by the way, Peter, who is for you the best goalkeeper who has ever played in Premier League? Do you have one? Oh, it's my son. Of course. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> when you see goalkeepers today, those risky passes from time to time playing as centre-backs during the match, with your main abilities you had and skills you had, Peter, would you have a chance to be that good as you were, Peter, 
um, you know, in today's football, honestly, because it's so different, right? I don't know. I mean, I get surprised now and again um, when when I see clips of how we played football. Because let's just take the best team at the moment, which is Man City. The way they play, it's fantastic to watch. And and then I get I, I see clips of us playing, and we played in the in completely the same way back in in the nineties. We and you kind of forget that uh, at times. And in that, of course, we didn't play as much back to the goalkeeper as we, they do now, but we still did. And and for me, I never I never even thought about it, and I never thought it was a problem. And I think if it had to be like that, well, I think I could have handled it. Yeah, I I, I think I think I was quite lucky in the way that at some of the clubs that I was at. The managers wanted or insisted on on goalkeepers always taking part in every 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 part of every training, and goalkeeping training was at other times. Um, so I always took part in in plays, different plays, and when they started. So this was in the nineties when they started to change the rules about back passes. You couldn't pick them up with your hands, and I was quite all right. There was a few guys there who weren't all right. Um, and then, of course, it, the rules kept changing, and the requirements of the goalkeeper being able to use uh, his feet and actually play changed. And you know, for what I was asked to do, it was all right. But I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's many years since I played. The, the game is very, very different today. You just don't know. Uh, but I'd I'd like to think that I I would have been able to deal with it. Right, um, let's move to present. Uh, I saw you talking to players as a TV reporter for CBS during the Champions League studio. How, how do you feel in that role and what do you exactly do to be even better in front of camera, Peter? It's, um, I really enjoy it now. Um, so, for, I, I mean, I've, I've done media work for 20 years now and um, it's been a lot of studio work and and on location work has very often also been like in a studio setup. So about two years ago, when they asked me to go out and be uh, be at games and be live reporting from games, I was a little bit, mm, I, I really started to enjoy getting to the game, smelling, you know, the feeling the atmosphere, smelling the grass, you know, being close to the players. And then they asked me to go and do interviews after games and I was very reluctant. I, I was uncomfortable because what do you ask them? I mean, you have to be very curious, but what do you ask them when you kind of feel that you know the answers? Um, and then I've had a couple of experiences with uh, players actually coming over to me, wanting to be talk to me, um, which makes sense because then they don't have to talk to other people, you know? <laughs> it, so if they talk to a footballer, they're quite more comfortable uh, and the, these situations has given me more 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 confidence to do it, um, and now I really enjoy it. It's it's great to be around the players, and uh, and and you know, I had the experience with Andrea and Anna Kim coming over to me on on Wednesday, uh, insisting on on talking to me about what happened in the game, and I felt I felt very humbled that he wanted to. To, to use me as uh, the first media to to come out and apologize and take responsibility for for what was just a mistake in the game you know uh, but it was it was very it was I, I felt quite good about that that he he, he did it and um, and then you have experiences like that you know you ask if you are, if you are at a game between Bayern Munich and Manchester United then everyone who has who holds the rights for the Champions League, everyone are there. And we all want to speak to the same people. But some of them, they are coming over to you automatically. So I interview both the managers. I, we had Harry Kane there, we had Onana, uh, we had Leroy Sané, man of the match. And, you know, once you get into that kind of uh, situation, environment, you know, it, make, it makes it, it, makes it quite, quite fun to be part of it. To those uh, goalkeeper situations at Old Trafford, uh, by the way, were you surprised when Man United announced that they are looking for a new number one? 
And despite the most clean sheets in the last Premier League season, this is the end for David De Gea. I don't know precisely what has happened because uh, I think the club and, and David De Gea, they, I think they they uh, were trying to extend his contract, renew his contract. So I don't precisely know what has happened there. Uh, it didn't happen and his contract ran out. So they had to find another one. Uh, so once that happened, I was very surprised they couldn't find an agreement because it's someone who's been at the club for 12 years and as you say there, you know, most clean sheets last season in the Premier League, uh, five times I think he's player of the year of Man United. You know, it, it, just a bit weird that all of a sudden he's not good enough to play for the club. There were some mistakes in 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 uh, in his performances last year, but you know he still played a really really big part in in you know winning one trophy and of course getting into top four, which then qualified us for Europe or, or the Champions League. So it was it's all a bit sort of. So Ten Hag knows Onana, uh, so he's 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 chosen him, and I think the way that that he wants to play, I think he fits in really well. But, uh, you know, it's been everything about, not, not just Andre Onana, but everything about Manchester United at the beginning of the season. It's been a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, and there's some off-field distractions. And there's a few things that aren't right at the moment. I think once we move past them, then we'll see we see the quality of some of the players uh, in a different light. And I think Andrew Anana is one of them. Peter, maybe the very last one, because we're running out of time. When you see Premier League this season, new way of refereeing, we can see matches with maybe 15 minutes of extra times, so many yellow cards for time-wasting. What is your opinion on that? Yeah. Oh, first of all, if you... I mean, I was at Manchester United for eight years and I think it worked out. I played a game every 4.2 day, something like 4.2, I think it was. When you play a game that often, then you don't want 15 minutes added to, to uh, the second half. I, I think that it happens every year that, uh, they want us, that the referees want to stamp down on certain situations and they want to... They want to, in the name of fairness, you know, they want to, you know, eradicate time wasting and and then they find a different way of, of dealing with it once we get into, you know, October, November and everything calms down a little bit and I think it's too much for 15 minutes. That's a lot. We had a game, not this weekend, the weekend before with 15 minutes added on. It's too much. And if you... I'm just saying, it's just you know, if you if you have like you know a late kickoff on a, on a midweek, you know eight o'clock, for instance at Tottenham, you know, and you add 15 minutes to that game, you know, first of all, you you, it's a very difficult place to get to, you know, people are going to get home, they need you know want to go to work the next day, they have to go to work the next, kids might kids might have to go to school, or kids are in the stadium, they have to go to school the next day. The tubes are not running all night, you know, so you might even, you might not even, I mean, there's a lot of consideration to go in. And of course, for the players to have these extra minutes, because it adds up, doesn't it? I hope it finds sort of a natural level where we see maybe six, seven maximum. And then I, I, with that, I think everyone can appreciate that. But 15, that's a lot. Peter, thank you very much for your honesty. It was a pleasure talking to you. Enjoy the rest of the season. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. See you again. Take care. Thank you.